Welcome to Saving America, one of our segments we call Just the Facts. And we've got a great guest for you today. We've got Robert Riggs in Dallas, host of True Crime Reporter podcast. Riggs taps into three decades of criminal cases from his career as an investigative reporter and committee investigator for the U.S. Congress. During his television news career, Riggs received the George Foster Peabody Award for investigative reporting and three Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Journalism Awards for investigative reporting. I'm delighted to have you with us today, Robert. Well, thank you so much. I love your moniker, Just the Facts, ma'am, from Dragon. <laughs> if we could just get back to Just the Facts. We, we need those old fashioned cops. You know, we, it's interesting because in the popular police stories that we see today, like Chicago PD and the Law and Orders and a lot of these shows, you see the police roughing up the, uh, the, the people being arrested. And in real life, those people would probably be on trial for, for brutality and denying human rights and all that stuff. So it, it's interesting those TV shows are so popular. Well, in the roughing up suspects is an anomaly. Uh, the Floyd case that we've seen is an, an anomaly. And it yes. certainly tells you something about the failure of leadership in that department. And Absolutely. when I hear city councils decry this kind of thing and, and outrage, I, I want to say to them, well, wait a minute. That's your department. You set the budget. You hire the chief. You set the policy. And what I've seen in 30 years of reporting is that, you know, they'll run for these incidents, but at the heart of it, is lack of training, uh, underpay, and uh, not proper background checks and screening. And it, it, it all goes back to the leadership of the city. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Robert, I wanted to back up a little bit uh, because due to the passage of time, and of course, uh, you know, we have a very age diverse population, many of our audiences may have forgotten the story of the serial killer. Kenneth McDuff, and I wonder if you could share a little bit about that story, and that's over 20 years old, I think. Well, it is 30 years old, and it's the subject of our first season of my podcast, True Crime Reporter, a uh, 17-episode series currently being made into a television documentary news series for a major, major streaming channel. It will be a big program, uh, like you see on Netflix and the others. But Kenneth McDuff, I'm going to describe him the way one of the players uh, described him to me when I saw him on Help, and that is he was the great white shark of serial killers, among the rarest of the rare, uh, who engaged in a sadistic torture of his victims. And um, this guy was a monster. He had been on death row, and we let him out of prison. And I did a big investigative expose of how he had uh, allegedly bribed his way out of prison, but at the same time, the state had a revolving door prison system in which they were letting everybody out. So who was going to notice, you know, I originally reported 63 former death row inmates had been released back in 1989 and 1990. And that's what the podcast is about. Uh, he's the only man in Texas history to get three death sentences. He's probably one of the worst serial killers in the country, and you've never heard of him. And how many people did he kill before he was finally dealt with? Well, there's an estimate that we kind of know of 18, but the wow. investigators all believe it's much, much higher. He, was, he traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles. Later, he said he was on the hunt. That, those are his words when he was on death row. He was hunting for victims. And so we will we'll never know. There are many, many women that just vanished. And that was kind of his MO. They would be at a convenience store, filling up the car with gas, might be on a pay phone. Somewhere they'd let their guard down uh, and bam, he strikes. And the big case uh, that a lot of people that shocked Austin was a, an, a young accountant is washing her new car after Christmas at a self-service car wash and he cruises in like a shark. I mean, the guy really was like a shark, he had shark-like eyes. Sneaks up on her, grabs her by the throat, and she's never seen again alive. Mm. Such, a, such a sad situation. Um, uh, hopefully he was finally executed. He was, he uh, received two death sentences. 
uh, first for the abduction and murder of a convenience store clerk in Waco named Melissa Northrup. Then after that one uh, for Colleen Reed, the 29-year-old accountant in Austin. And these the two different prosecutors, two different jurisdictions, because he had gotten off death row, they wanted an insurance policy. They wanted to make sure that he would never be on the street again, that he could never bribe his way out of prison, that a liberal parole board would never release him again. Excellent. And by the way, that, that case of my investigation led to major reforms in the system uh, to where today you, they were called the McDuff laws. And you do have an option to the death penalty, which is life without parole. And it truly means life without parole. You know, you leave the prison system in a pine box. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let's look at the, the uh, Dallas Crime Commission awarded you the first ever Excellence in Crime Reporting Award in 1999. Tell our audience about the underlying case and your role in reporting it. There was a it was nationwide attention put on a, an affluent suburb in Plano, Texas, and suddenly teenagers were dying of heroin overdoses. Uh, it was black tar heroin called Chiva. It had been brought in by a cartel member, and it, it was so pure that it was killing these kids, and they didn't know that it was heroin, and the drug dealers were lacing it in marijuana and other things purposely because they wanted clients that would be addicted. And these kids just started dropping left and right. They would go into a coma. So I literally, uh, and uh, one of my colleagues, Alan Berg, we track the flow of black tar from the Mexican cartels from Mexico all the way into Plano, how it got here, how they distributed it, how they did everything. And then the other series was what was probably the first series in the country on identity theft. Today, it's everywhere. It's epidemic. But you know, it included stories about how postal carriers were being paid to steal mail that looked like bills, social security and stuff to get all the identifying data. Uh, it involved how more sophisticated groups were producing uh, fraudulent checks. I interviewed for that frack, Frank Abagnale, who is the subject of the movie Catch Me If You Can, Yes. played by Leonardo DiCaprio. I saw the movie. Yes, and so actually he, he became an expert on identity theft with checks. And, and uh, I watched him do an amazing presentation of bank, bank fraud examiners where he used the internet and literally in about five minutes was producing checks, fraudulent checks, $30,000 each that would sail through American Airlines and be cashed and the airline probably wouldn't realize it for three to four months. So I did, you know, I did that whole series from street level that was taking place to that to build public awareness. And uh, so the FBI was involved in uh, asking the Crime Commission to recognize me and I was honored to do so. It was a great honor for that group in this city to do that. They've always been kind of a, a pillar of the community and putting up rewards for information leading to the arrest and conviction of criminals. Well, we hear that dealing with the cartel or doing anything that hurts the cartel's business can involve personal risk. Were you ever personally threatened during this time? Actually, my personal threats came from uh, my expose of the bribery and the parole system. When I started exposing that and inmates were realizing that they couldn't get out of prison anymore, uh, the threat started. And then really the attention got deflected to Kenneth McDuff. He kind of became, he was the poster boy for reform. And so he's captured, he's tried, he's on death row. And he was the most hated man in the prison system. But like McDuff, now we have to do longer sentences because of you. Now we can't bribe our way out because you were caught. So he actually was in solitary confinement on death row because so many inmates just wanted to kill him and it would have been a badge of honor. <laughs> Amazing situation. Uh, let's move a little bit more to the, the current day. Um, you, you presented two incredible stories recently on your website. The preacher and the pipe bomber who almost got away with 
murdering their wives. This sounds like a made for TV uh, special. This didn't sound like a, the real story. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, this is uh, something that my par a new partner in the podcast was all involved in, Bill Johnston. Bill is the former federal prosecutor from Waco. Bill prosecuted the Branch Davidians. He wrote the original search warrant for the raid. Bill has prosecuted terrorists in his career. He had an amazing record, never lost a case in front of a jury. And he prosecuted the parole board chairman behind my stories. But the other interesting thing is Bill was the first person in the community to kind of realize that Kenneth McDuff, serial killer out, might it was the, the person behind the abduction of that convenience store clerk. And he single-handedly launched this manhunt that turned into a nationwide manhunt. So Bill has come in with me, and now in private practice, uh, people come to him about unsolved crimes and complex fraud cases. And this was a case where a beloved Baptist minister in Waco, Texas, very charismatic, uh, they dig in and they find out that uh, he, he had murdered her tried to stage it to look like she had overdosed, uh, did a very poor job of staging, and they, uh, they uncovered other things. There were other women that had been uh, rape victims of this man. Uh, they, uh, they recovered a computer at a, at a volunteer organization that he used. And guess what they find on it? One, porn, lots of porn, and two, uh, his search for uh, certain kinds of medications and drugs to, to kill you. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, it is an amazing case. And it's also a case that demonstrates how very small police departments cannot handle complex homicide cases. That's the reason we have the Texas Rangers to go in and stuff. But, you know, you find people, your egos get in the way. And, you know, you're not going to tell me how to do this. And I've seen it over and over in my case where a very small department, they don't have the resources. They don't have the know-how and they just bungle these cases. And so he uncovers all of this and the district attorney opens an investigation and, and the man's convicted. Excellent. Excellent. And, and what about the, the pipe bomber? Well, this is another case that where uh, Bill is a private, uh, uh, well, it's still prosecuting cases was brought in and a, uh, uh, a big a package came into an office in the Waco area and um, delivered just to the office. And they opened it and it, it contained an enormous pipe bomb enormous that would have taken down the building next door to that office. It would have killed everybody in that office and taken down the building next door. It was huge. But the bomber had made one mistake and it didn't detonate. Thank Excellent. God. It did not detonate yeah. when it was supposed to detonate when they opened. It turned out that the bomber was actually trying to kill his soon to be ex-wife in the who worked in the office. So he was he didn't, you know, he didn't want it to point back to him. So he just gonna kill everyone in the office, including her. And Bill got involved and they did an intensive forensic investigation. And they found a hair in the pipe bomb. And it was the hair that belonged to this rare, rare breed of dog. And after great police work and forensics work, they tracked it back to the man who built the bomb. And they found the, you know, they found the dog there, they found the hair there, and what have you. But you know, they might never have solved that crime if the bomb had gone off. And good lord, it would have killed so, so many people. Well, it, it's uh, we could do this for hours, but we try and keep this short so people will actually pay attention and be interested. Um, and tell tell our audience uh, how they can get some more information about you, Robert. All fascinating stuff you're working on. Yep. Well, the name of the podcast is True Crime Reporter. It's in all of your podcast apps: Pandora, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google. We're everywhere. And then we have a website, truecrimereporter.com. You can sign up for a newsletter there to receive updates on what we're doing, uh, uh, bonus information, you know, interviews from the podcast that you won't see in the podcast, extra material if you join. And then we have a second podcast we've 
started called SWAT Brothers. It's aimed at uh, uh, ex-members of law enforcement. We talk about law enforcement issues today. Certainly the general public, you're, you're going to learn a lot of stuff that's going to make you want to be way more careful with what's going on with defund the police. So true crime reporter, uh, we're on all the podcast apps, truecrimereporter.com. And 70% of our audience is, are women. Women really do like true crime. And this is the only true crime podcast where you're going to hear from the actual detectives and every the investigators who work the cases. Most of the true crime podcasts are kind of pretenders. They're taking uh, material from books. They're plagiarizing from uh, <laughs> the online, and they're just kind of telling the story. But I want to tell you, they've never been inside a crime scene tape. They've never been on death row. They've never been in a maximum security prison. We have. Robert, it's been a great pleasure to have you on our show today. This is Just the Facts, part of our Saving America series. And thanks so much for being with us today.